Welcome to the DSEF. The Direct Selling Executives Forum was created to be a place where real direct selling executives and vendors in the space can come out and share solutions to challenges that face us all in the marketplace. Our guest today is going to be unpacking a topic and sharing their raw thoughts for you to learn from. All right, let's go meet our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our next episode of the Direct Selling Executives Forum. I'm so excited for Omar to come out and host today and bring our guest here out here to the line. You can see your smiling face already. It's going to be a ton of fun. So why did we invite Christine to come out and be here with us today? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Christine. She loves direct sales and has a heart for hustle and the people in them. Now, I've loved working with her for the short time we've known each other. It's been super exciting. She's been an executive in brands for over 20 years and CEO of Chalk Tour from its launch through its PE transaction in 2021. Since 2022 has been president of Moji Life, which recently finalized a partnership with The Happy Co., a client of ours. And she's written multiple books on topics including nutrition and personal finance. It's a popular keynote speaker, on branding and work-life balance topics, loves Diet Coke, Disney, and dogs. See what's not to like. Uh, if she's not at her desk, she's running in the canyons near her home in beautiful Utah. Christine, thanks for being here today. We're so pumped to have you. Thanks for having me, you guys. This is going to be fun. It is. Hi, Christine. So so grateful to have you. Thank you. You bet, Mary. Nice to meet you. So there's there's yeah. so many mergers going on right now. When we were talking as a team and we said, man, we got to just unpack this topic. We have this idea of keys to merging cultures well during an acquisition. And Omar and I were talking to her, we're like, I wonder if Christine would be up for sharing. So thank you. Thank you for being here today. So with that, let's start the show. Omar, we're passing it to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Christine, for joining us today. Uh, today, the topic is very interesting. Uh, keys to uh, merging cultures well in acquisition. So the the questions from the panel would be, uh, we see many mergers and acquisitions, you know, uh, going on in the direct selling space. You and the team at Moji Life just navigated a merger with the Happy Co. Uh, what would you say surprised you the most about the process? First of all, what surprises me, th this is my fifth rodeo, or I, I could say mm -hmm. it's my my fifth my fifth marriage, but I've only ever had one husband. Um, so I've <laughs> been through this a few times. And you know what surprises me about the process is that it is not as hard as you think. It can feel very overwhelming as you're thinking of bringing together financial back offices, platforms, ERPs, different supply chain, all the other things that have to happen, not the least of which, and perhaps the biggest of which is the, is the culture marriage. But it is not as hard as you think, especially when you involve the field, there are a lot more of your, whether you call them brand partners or ambassadors or representatives or stylists, there are so many more of them than any employee at the employee headcount at the, at the head office. So sure. work, work with them and it will be so much easier. That's such a, that's such a great thought too, is, is that I think that many times we think that it's all on, all on us. That's such a good note. That's, yeah. it's, it's well, really I always think like we're, we're yeah. their, we're their partner, not their parent. If you think like parentally, you're like, I've got to protect them. I've got to insulate them. There are things that I don't want them to know. It's my job to be responsible and credible. And, and perhaps a lot of those things are true. But if you think of them as I am, I am their partner, not their parent, then you want to be as transparent and accessible and they will help you make the process smoother because they want it to win. They want it to succeed as well. It's their path forward. Yeah. Sure. You know, it's so funny. I think this is, it's just so relevant. I'm a part of a fast growing church uh, where I live and we've acquired uh, two other churches that were struggling uh, in the last three years and merged them into our campus full. So we have five campuses now, right? At our, wow. at our church here in Chicago. Wow. And I think many times of the similarities between what you just went through, Christine, for some of the things we talked about, and almost like when your church gets another church campus is that these people are not employees, like Christine said. They're they're volunteers. So it's so it's that that uh, sometimes there's a framework that's always so helpful. We always look to pull those out when we bring a guest on, like Christine. And what she just said about hey, you got to get the field involved because it's really about them. Like that reminder of like yeah, it's not just about the 17 people here or the or the 87 people here that were on staff at the direct selling company. You know, it's how how do we think about um, what it's going to be like for all of our brand ambassadors. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you say it too, you say it just right. I love your comparison to a congregation because this yeah. is deeply personal. 
yes, this can be about their income and, and my rice bowl and how is the new comp plan going to work or what new products might I have to sell. But we make decisions with our heart first and our head second. And so we, we have to realize that just like merging a congregation, it's all about how people feel. And sometimes I think on the employee side, when you're working to make a new partnership happen, you're really looking at financials and platforms and systems and the job of the partnership or the merger or the acquisition. And yeah. you have to look at it like the community, the religion, the purpose, because if you break people's hearts, their heads will not follow. Yes, that's good. That's the quote. <laughs> There's the Jay, like, you break their Jay. hearts, their heads won't follow. Ah, man. Oh, I want to hear how we do that. So, so go ahead. Well, I think we have some around that. Go ahead, Omar. That's good. Oh, cool. thank you very much. Great insight that was, Christine. Thank you. Uh, for the others, you know, who are considering a merger, what would you encourage them to go uh, to do ahead of time to prepare? Yeah, that's a... um, well. There's there's a lot that's a that's a ahead of time. First of all, I think a timeline to do something like this is perhaps a little bit longer than people think if you're going to do it well often that you know it's that it's that metaphor of the duck that looks like it's sitting on the water very calmly but its feet are paddling in the water underneath your feet need to be paddling a good three to four months, but because information leads to inspiration. So if you want your field to feel inspired, you've got to lay a lot of the groundwork well ahead of time. So I think three to four months is a reasonable timeline. And depending on some of the complexities or the size of your organization or the age of your organization, it could take longer. But this is not something that you hatch at the beginning of the month and say, we're going to be ready to rock and roll in three weeks. You're going to struggle hard. So I think when you look at it from the time to prepare and what to prepare in advance, I think they're uh, using a really helpful tool. Like, like I said, I've been through this a couple of times, working with a checklist that is completely rational and that you can even Gantt chart it out if you need to. But I like to work with a spreadsheet that literally has a tab for financials, a tab for back office and compensation, a tab for product, how are we going to move product? Um, a tab for, and this is the biggie, and this is this is where my heart lives. I've always lived in marketing and field development. How are we going to let the field know when are we going to, and doing it in tranches. And I think if you get really granular, you'll stay on course. You'll be able to plot some of those things out, and you'll realize this step is going to take us three weeks, and it can't be done concurrently. It has to be done sequentially to this piece um, and it just kind of keeps you grounded. Otherwise, I think the enormity of eating the elephant can be very overwhelming and you might actually start telling your field too soon or not enough. And then that frustrates them. It should be a very exciting announcement to your field. And so I think timing it to know when to involve your field is really important. Too early and it will be chaotic. If you wait too late, they'll actually feel like you were withholding information from them. And I, I really yeah. believe successful PR starts with a three Fs. You have to own it first, own it fast and own it fully. And so in as much as we can be transparent and real human beings, I actually texted because it's not always going to be perfect. And so don't, don't try to blow sunshine up people's skirts. Yeah. Our job is, you know, be their partner, not their parent. I sent a text a week ago to a, to a very top leader in our organization where I said, I am so sorry, this thing was done wrong and the fault is mine and mine alone. Like you have to be willing to own your errors because yeah. you're going to have them. And that's part of the process. Those errors will mm -hmm. happen. And the faster that you can own it, the more that your field will be like, listen, they're not trying to hide anything from us. They're humans doing the best they can to merge all of these different systems and departments and processes. If you can show your humanity, I think that people are much more willing to support you when you stumble. A couple big gold nuggets from what you're just sharing there, Christine, that I think are really important for everybody. It, you know, you talked about by by doing the work of timelining it out, you can understand what can be done concurrently and what cannot. That is such a powerful exercise. Just thinking through what you just said is, hey, what can be done concurrently and what cannot? If you miss that part of the exercise, it can have all kinds of other ramifications down down the path. And so I love that yeah. thought and that note. So just as a shout out to those of you who are taking notes and listening and saying, all right, what do I got to think? You, you got to ask the question, what can be done concurrently? What cannot? 
I, I know people want to ask, so I, I want to ask. So how, how do you know the right time to tell the field then? Like if it's, you know, oh, we okay. The risk. Okay. We get the risk. I, I think it uh, is. What, what was, what was um, the triggers that we said, you know, when there, uh, when there aren't any more, what ifs. So mm -hmm. if there are, I, I think you start telling the field when you know, it's going to happen. It's not when, when you're out of the area of speculation, yeah. we're talking about it, or it might happen. You're just going to introduce a lot of unease when you have a clear path and you know what that path will look like for them, but you want their information and their insight on how to roll it out. So for example, if you are, a lot of these require the melding of two different compensation plans. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have the opportunity to pick and pull, to take the best of both worlds or to adapt. I think that if you know this partnership is gonna happen, we have comp plan A, comp plan B, and comp plan C. And here's something that we are able to continue system-wise because you don't want to have those conversations if the platform that you're moving to can't support a certain feature that your field loves. Mm -hmm. So when once you know, I think the things that have to be done before you tell the field is understand how your financial platform will zipper together and their back office platform, the experience that they have when they place orders and um, get commissions, sponsor new team members. Once you kind of understand what levers you can pull, bring them in so you can say, this is what we're learning. How does this feel to you? How should we communicate it? So the second that you have that it's happening, and we know how the back office and the comp plan can function, then you can start bringing them in. And that, and when you said them, and that's the top level leadership. Um, really. Absolutely. We're, not, Absolutely. we're not talking about shooting out an email with a whole database at that point. No, no, no. That's truly the inner circle people who will then trickle down to the others. And that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, cool. And they're, they're under a, an NDA. Typically they're yeah. held in confidence. Um, because you so desperately need their insights uh, because you cannot possibly understand how all the dominoes yeah. will fall, um, but they will tell you. And you know what I think, too, is um, a big takeaway if you're in corporate leadership is if you have a top leader who is um, upset or who's constantly pointing out things that are going wrong, oh, my gosh, you need to reach over the table and embrace that person. Every time they yeah. send in an email of something that didn't go smoothly or something that's broken it's because they care. They care so much. And the second those emails stop, you have a problem. So yeah. you need to like shout yeah. glory hallelujah every time you yeah. get a complaint because yeah. it means that people are watching and they want to help you fix it. And that is very, very good. You know, and it's one of those right notes answer. too, when you think about the 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 next tranche of people, you know, I, I have seen this before in the past and I think it's it something that Christine's team did well. So you didn't pick an actual flip over date until everything was done. You know, you don't, you don't even think about trying to keep people. I think there's a lot of pressure people put themselves under on the executive team to say, well, we need it, we need a date. And the, the challenge in any of these migrations is you, you not only, you have all these third parties that are serving both organizations needing to, to meld together or one needs to get out of the way and the other one needs to get in and then and, and, and you're, so it's finance, it's operations, it's commission tracking, it's marketing. It's a lot of different it's this warehouse offer versus that warehouse offer. There's a lot that goes into the heart surgery, you know, that that is melding two yeah. companies together. And so one of the worst mistakes I've seen is to kind of just pull a date out of their, their chest thinking, ah, here's, that's what it will be. And before all these things have come together, that happens, they usually get completely done with the project where their level of confidence is, yeah, we could do it today. And then they look at each other and say, okay, let's tap everyone. It's in two weeks. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's the way I've seen the really good ones actually work on the, for the, oh, I'm so the, glad the, you the, said the, that. The, I think I'm so glad you said that. Cause sometimes yeah. you do, you start with the date in mind and then you back up to it and things always take a little longer than you think with this recent partnership. We had, first of all, truly believe that the more you can bring people together in person, one of my tips would be, if you're going to be melding cultures, give people an opportunity to spend face time and grace time because they need to be together and they need to mourn and let go of whatever identity they had when they were their own company. And that is not problematic or wrong. So sometimes we think that's yeah. a pitfall. It's not a pitfall. It's a process. And so when you can have people together and they can be like, 
this is like, this is hard for me. I came into this brand and I love this brand. And now I'm going to go through this evolution. And even though I still have my products or I still have my team, it feels very disruptive. Uh, we as leaders have to be like, not only do we need to provide that face time, we need to provide that grace time. Put your arm around someone and say, it's okay. And cry on my shoulder. Don't shut it down. Let it happen because it you have to go through that stage. So I think you bring people together in this most recently, you're talking about timing. We brought people together the first weekend of October, really laid out for them the vision, did product training, had that face time and grace time, but then did not immediately cut over systems. We said, you have the rest of the month. It's like three more weeks because it's, it's a little bit like being told we're moving out of our house but you don't get any time to pack your stuff. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so by yeah. giving everybody three weeks, they're like, okay, I have three weeks to inform. I'm in charge. I get to inform my customers. I can, if I have any uh, product yeah. credits or other things in the old system, I can clean them out and redeem them. Like the company is honoring me. If you're trying to run away in the night or make a cut over, you know, within 24 hours after telling your field, to me, that also says, you weren't prepared or you're or you're going to leave something behind in that house that you left. Give them a few weeks. I don't know what the time is for every company. Uh, yep. For our last, um, for this partnership, we gave them three weeks. And honestly, by the end of three weeks, they were telling us it's time to go. We're champing at the bit. We are yeah. so ready. And that's when you know, okay, now we can move forward. No, it's so important because I've seen the opposite end of that gang and it breeds distrust. It, people feel like you were hiding something. Like why, why did they have to flip over in a day without trusting us to tell us they must have, they must have been hiding something. Oh, there, they must have really been on a, that must have been really been a barn fire. It must have been you know? desperate or oh, something. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this is was... intentional <laughs> and you have. Yep. You want to download your accounts. You want yeah. to look at all your reports. Yeah. Your system is intact. You have it for this time. And they just kind of go, great. Now I have this chance to process and to walk forward with you. And like I said, if you give them enough time at the end of it, they'll be pushing you to flip the switch. <laughs> and that's exactly what you want. It is. It's so interesting of what you said. I've seen that to be true, not only for mergers of companies, but just for uh, new softwares. So when someone flips virtual offices or back offices or new technology, yeah. I don't like doing it at convention. I hate doing it at convention. I actually think that's a horrible time to flip your new tech from my personal opinion, from just watching. Oh, it, I hear you. To, uh, well, everybody's, uh, their, their brain their, is in event mode. You're not yeah. in the mode of, I need to switch my All whole way. My processes. It's a great I place for that. an announcement. Yes. And, and you training. can say, this is what we're going to do. Oh, and yeah. this is the plan. Week yep. one, we'll see this. Week two, we'll see this. And the more that there is intentionality in the flip over, yes. the more that your field will feel the intentionality in the partnership and it will not feel like a shotgun marriage, but one born yeah. of love and mutual compliment. <laughs> yes, that's good. Great right. insight, great insight guys, thank you. Right, so next question is, uh, we're all about frameworks, how they can follow the DSEF here. Um, are there any frameworks you would like to share from your experiences in the merger? I, I think the, the main framework that I think is a great discipline is having that spreadsheet that lists out tasks and getting agreement on the tasks, having very specific people identified who own those tasks, and there should be only one. If you're familiar with the book Traction by Gino Wickman, it's one of my favorites. And I love, love, love that. And he very clearly says only one person can own something. And so if you're trying to do, because suddenly you might even have some redundancy, you know, you've got two marketing teams and two finance teams. You have to be very clear in this transaction, who owns what, um, because everybody will want to be helpful, but own your zone. And it doesn't mean you're alone. I know, sorry, a little rhyming thing, own your zone, but never alone. You can ask for help, but people need to understand this is the person who's going to own this piece of it. So build the framework, De decide the deadline for every single task and assign one person and one person only to bring that task home. Well, I, I was like getting shivers as you said, traction. I know why we're good friends now. So we've been <laughs> using traction for 13 years. I love Gino's work. It's the so, best. And I love giving book recommendations on the DSEF. We've talked about traction before on this Retraction. show. Retraction. Retraction. If you haven't read Gino's work, 
One thing that's great about it, Gino has done a very good job of creating a network of implementers who are very successful business owners that are retired or sold their businesses that come and they, each one normally only has five to eight clients at a time. And mm-hmm. they'll they come and actually implement those book practices with you. So you can you could take this tip as, as as deep as you want to take it into your organization. You could it is the framework. Staff. It is it, the it is framework the- for doing a business. Yeah. If you want to know how to organize from organizing your leadership team, defining your 10-year plan, your five-year goals, and your one-year tactical strategy, look to Gina Workman. It also, I think, if I can just like praise yeah. traction a little bit more, yeah. uh, it also identifies that typically in companies, um, especially in direct selling, they're often founded by an innovator, by a visionary. Yep. But yep. The visionary, in order to be successful, needs to have a partner that Gino refers to as the integrator. And yep. so your acquisition, your merger, your partnership needs both of those roles. Identify who the visionary is in this process. And it need, you need one clear visionary. And that person often is not great with detail. In fact, sometimes they can be frustratingly terrible with detail. Yeah. But the yeah. integrator is the person who will hold those balloons down to earth and make it happen. So I would recommend as you look at the framework, use the traction framework. It won't steer you wrong. It's very clear and not artsy fartsy either. Yeah. It's super accessible and identify who your visionary is and who your integrator is. And it'll go very smoothly. The section Christine just spoke about is a part of accountability charts in the book. And many times when we talk about books on the show, I'm always encouraging you to grab it on, grab that one on audio, grab that one on audio. Don't grab this one on audio. This is the one to get on paperback. There's a lot of charts. Okay. I I referred it to a local business owner that goes to church with me. And he's like, Ben, I just don't get it. And I'm like, everyone I've given this. Don't listen to it. it. Don't listen to it. He had grabbed it on audible. I said, no, no, no. Here, I'm going to mail you a copy. And so it is the one book I tell people to get there. And for those of you that are in bigger businesses, listen, I know we have some larger in- industries. I recommend traction from zero to 40 million a year, zero to 40 million a year. Traction's the guide, okay? It's amazing. Some of you are past 40 million a year. You're listening to this. There's a book from Gazelles called Scaling Up. It's more of a textbook. It's it's a little deeper of the similar principles, but deeper gets into yeah. the cash flow principles. And I like it. He actually even acknowledges step. you're going to hit a ceiling. When yeah. you, you follow these principles, even when you're doing everything right, you'll hit a ceiling. And then yeah. he advises you what you need to do to, to scale up from there. But I agree with that. Have a printed copy of Traction, my personal one. I have put sticky notes that are color coded for every time there is a PDF or a tool that I need to be using because they're downloadable PDFs that come with it. I yeah. color code that in orange. Anytime there is a teaching or a training that I can use with my team, I color code that in yellow. And it is It is my playbook. And so if you're looking for a fantastic framework, don't reinvent the wheel. Do not go this alone. There are great tools out there. And I think Traction is one of the best. It it is. If you need extra help, there's implementers you can get to, gang. So there you go. We we are fan. We are are all fanboys and girls of Traction. You caught us. (laughs) There you go. But it's true. That's Great a insight. There, I didn't Thank even, you. I had no idea you were going to share it today. I'm so, oh, I feel. Fun. I love that you love it. We're just oh, having a moment here, I man. You've got shit everywhere. So that's great. All right, I'll back to you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, guys. Uh, the last question from the panel we have okay. is, uh, are there any pitfalls you encountered that you would like to share for others to avoid? Oh, gosh. Okay, first, is this going to sound counterintuitive when I say, yes, there are pitfalls, and you can't avoid them. You have to grow through what you go through. And so first of all, relax, just relax and lean into it. If you're doing this, it's because it's the right thing to do. And you know it in not just the financials, you know it in your heart, you know, this is going to be okay. And so accept that a little bit of chaos is part of of the whole thing and just lean into it. When it gets really uncomfortable, say this is exactly how it's supposed to work. Some things that surprised me were integrating platforms was not that hard. Today's platforms, like I said, this is my fifth rodeo. Platforms today have gotten better and better and better at making these kind of transitions. And so they are used to huge data migrations where even a couple of years ago, it was not as easy. And so there are amazing tools. If you're using one of the best in breed platforms, like, like the Nexum platform, they do make these sort of things far easier. That used to be the stumbling block. And even for the field, they'd be like, I can't see my reporting. I can't see my commissions. I can't see my billing data used to be horrible. That used to be the pitfall. It's it's really not. 
it's really not anymore. Um, I was telling Ben the biggest pitfall was I didn't even get his email to prep for this webinar because it went to my old email address and that's on me. I should have sent an email out to all my contacts. So if you're, you know, if sometimes things get a little lost in transition. I've been like, oh, Ben, I have a new email now. And we, we forget that. But I think there are fewer and fewer pitfalls, except the ones that are right here um, in thinking, will people embrace this? They yeah. want you to win. They want to win. They want their teams to have a way forward. And what we're seeing right now in the industry is a lot of very natural consolidation. And so people need to be open to that. I think the brand that I've been partnering with, HCO, is very open to looking at new opportunities where there are synergies. So look for, if you're if you're on the market, either looking to add to your brand or looking for your brand to be added to another brand, look for brands that are complementary because it's an amazing time. It allows us to share fulfillment in warehouses, to share platforms so that it can become a lot more lucrative on the financial side and give your fields even more people to love and more products to sell. And so that can be a good thing if we're willing to kind of walk through that valley of discomfort to get there. And thank you for being so honest about sharing even some of the pitfalls ahead. You know, I think when we leave the field out of these conversations and we assume too much, we miss out on all kinds of opportunities to to keep people. You know, some of the math is not pretty on some of the consolidation. Yeah. You know, there's there's cultures to where people say, wow, only half of our uh, organization made it to the new opportunity or well, only two thirds made it to the new opportunity. And we say, you know what? It's like, what could you do different? We always want to open You, you have to give yourself, like I, I probably say this literally 10 times a week, bless and release. Yeah. Like you have to bless and release. Yeah. I love this industry. Triers are going to try. You're going to attract new people and you're going to lose some people in the transition and you love them hard and let them go. And that is okay. Um, the the best way to hold on to what you have is recognizing that you don't have anything. Everything that yep. you have is because these amazing people choose to be a part of your organization. And the more you can relax and let go and trust them, the more your brand will win. So what you just spoke of is a framework we'll end on because I love okay. that. Um, I actually made that my family theme. We pick a theme at the Dixon House each year. So of two course you do. Pick. Of course we do, right? We sit around, or yes, we sit around and we eat food and we pick a family theme. So we picked stewardship as a family theme uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, will be three years ago now, right? And uh, it's stuck. The, it's been a part of everything moving forward since because it's called the perspective of stewardship. And it's what you just talked about, Christine, not seeing your distributors as this thing you own, not seeing your job as this thing you own, but seeing it as this thing you've been entrusted with. And yeah. you're doing your best with the thing you are entrusted with while the time you're entrusted with it. And if you don't do a good job of of stewarding your relationship to your distributors, if you don't do a good job of stewarding your relationship to the company, guess what? You won't be entrusted with it for long. And so instead of seeing things as, oh, this is not fair, they were mine and now it's not. That's not the energy, folks. The more helpful framework mentally for you and what is actually more true is that you're just being entrusted with this for a season and you'd be yeah. amazed Everything in your life is that way, right? So we challenge our family to say, hey, our relationship as spouses, as parents to our children, as children of our parents. Hey, I'm stewarding being a good son, being a good father, uh, being a good husband. And I got to show up and do those things each day or you won't be a good one for long. It's the same relationship with your field reps and your peers in your corporate team. So ditto it, all that. Yes, what, yes. what that said. <laughs> but you, but you, you know, you pull it right out. And I just want to give a word to it again. What Christine's talking about in that relationship is stop putting that crazy narcissistic pressure on yourself of I own it all and it was mine. Of of no, it's you're stewarding it right now. You've been entrusted with it. Are you gonna do a good job? Is you're gonna be able to get through these hard times much better when the challenges do arise with an attitude of stewardship. So with 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 it, this is a total treat. Oh, Christine, big steak or dinner or whatever. Next time she's in town, yeah. God, this was so fun. This was awesome. So thank you for taking a moment from a very, very busy part of your schedule to be here on the show. We're so grateful uh, just to, for the work we get to do together, Christine, to have you here. So, and, and for those of you that are brand new, just checking out the DSCF, look up Christine on LinkedIn, check out what she's up to. She has a very exciting new season ahead post-acquisition. Go read about it. Check out her LinkedIn. There's a cool link 
And under her bio, you can check out about what she's up to. Oh, and nice. for those of you who are, are just watching this on Spotify or on YouTube and you're not in the LinkedIn group, you're missing out because you're not a part of the real panel. So go to directsellingexecutivesforum.com. Go, it's free. Go apply as a direct selling executive to join the forum. And yeah, you won't regret it. It's a lot of fun. Have an amazing day. Thank gang. you for saying Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye. Guys, see you. Bye. See ya. If you haven't yet joined the DSEF group on LinkedIn, go to directsellingexecutiveforum.com or go on LinkedIn and search for Direct Selling Executive Forum to apply. The group is free and is an invite-only community of direct selling executives by direct selling executives. Oh, 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 o